Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy yes. Memorial Day. Just keep talking without them. Yeah, but you know what happens? After church, I get asked the same exact questions that I said up here. Okay, that's... Oh, is it? That's normal. Because they don't listen to me? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I work with Todd. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, back to the beginning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy, happy New Year. I keep saying Happy New Year. I just don't know. Okay, let's start over again. Happy Memorial Day. Um, this week is our last week for Amcor, so please, <clears throat> please write your checks and write Amcor in the memo line, um, and we will, Jamie will decide, I guess we'll all decide where the money's going to go. Um, there's a potluck luncheon on the 29th, which is Wednesday. 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 <laughs> Wednesday. Oh, it does say Wednesday. It does. We have a guest minister coming in uh, from Angola. And so instead of the Bible study on Wednesday, we are moving our weekly study up to 1230. And we will be able to meet with him and visit with him. So um, it's potluck. We're going to meet down in the fellowship hall. So if you're interested at all, Please come join us 12.30 Wednesday downstairs in the fellowship hall. Okay, it should be very interesting. It's good to see Vicki Betts back. Thank you. I've been thinking of Richard a lot lately. Just, I, I bet you have. Um, is there anything else? I had one other thing to say. What was it? Oh, I know. I'm going to Helena this week, but don't worry, I am not in charge of the children. I'm, all, I'm going to spend the days, a couple days with my daughter. So, if there's nothing else, I'll move. On. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> join me in our opening prayer. Your spirit calls us here, O God, to behold the glory of your majesty and power, for adopting us into your family and making us heirs with Christ, we thank you, for freeing us from the failings of flesh, that we may be born anew with water and spirit. We praise you. Amen. The opening hymn is America the Beautiful on page 696 of the United Methodist Hymn.
I grow taller at that time of year. Okay, if you will join me in a modern affirmation on page 885. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the crown of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in the time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. i 
From the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, the Divine Throne Room. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a high and exalted throne, the edges of his robe filling the temple. Winged creatures were stationed around him. Each had six wings. With two they veiled their faces, with two their feet, and with two they flew about. They shouted to each other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heavenly forces. All the earth is filled with God's glory. The door frame shook at the sound of their shouting, and the house was filled with smoke. I said, Mourn for me. I'm ruined. I'm a man with unclean lips, and I live among people with unclean lips. Yet I've seen the King, the Lord of heavenly forces. Then one of the winged creatures flew to me, holding a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed, and your sin is removed. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Whom should I send, and who will go for us? I said, I'm here, send me. This is now the time when we share our tithes and offerings back to the Lord. Please join me in our offering prayer. Spirit of the living God, you offer us rich blessings and a church family to guide our way. We are your children, eager to show you our gratitude and our love. May this offering be a sign of our commitment to live as brothers and sisters of Christ. Bless our gifts this day, O oh God, that others may be blessed by them. May they help those in need be born anew in your spirit and blessed in your holy name. Amen. chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it isn't an obligation to ourselves to live our lives on the basis of selfishness. 
If you live on the basis of selfishness, you are going to die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. All who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you are adopted as his children. With this spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ. If we really suffer with him, so that we can also be glorified with him. Our Psalter is Psalm 29 on page 761 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Thursday, so prayers for him and his recovery. 
And he's asked prayers for his sister, Angie Logan, who has a recurrence of cancer. So please pray for Angie in your, today. Were there any other prayer requests that I did not receive? Okay, let's go to a time of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, the Lord of hosts, creator of all that we see, we thank you. Thank you for this wonderful world we live in. Thank you for the senses you have given us to be able to enjoy this world around us. And thank you for this Christian family that you have given to us to worship together, to laugh together, to grieve together, to uphold each other. We pray, Lord, that you hear our requests, whether they be spoken or unspoken. You know our hearts, and you know our needs far better than we do, Lord. Pray for your wisdom, your guidance, your patience, your healing touch, and your peace. Jesus, we thank you that you loved us so much that you came to show us what God was like, is like, and to die on the cross for us, that we may come boldly before the Lord with our prayers and concerns. And we remember now the way that you, you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. At this time, we have our hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, page 117 in the hymnal or up on the screen. <laughs>
All right, this thing working? Yeah. All right. For those of you who have never met me before, and I'm not sure, I think most of you have. My name is Ira Robinson. I'm a retired elder, dare I say, of the Yellowstone Conference. <laughs> yes. I was ordained deacon at the opening session of the Yellowstone Annual Conference in 1969, <coughs> ordained elder in 1973, served local churches for 35 years after that, and retired. Moved to Missoula, and I love it here. <laughs> I have preached here for you before. And I always enjoy coming to our gatherings of First United Methodist Church and Grace when we gather together, like at the park, mm -hmm. uh, when we have our Holy Week shared services. I enjoy being part of those and find those shared gatherings to be significant and very meaningful to me. So thank you for welcoming me this morning as I welcome you to this time. Scripture that I am using for the basis for my sermon is fairly well known probably to you. It starts the context of Jesus speaking to a Pharisee but not referring to the Pharisee as a white and sepulchre or a hypocrite in this case. Jesus meets with Nicodemus. This contains a couple of very popular Bible verses. But I ask you to listen carefully. Sometimes when we hear familiar scriptures, we already know what it says. But God might be using this to say something different to you today. From the third chapter of John's Gospel. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but in order that the world might be saved through him. May God add a blessing to this reading of the Holy Word. So, unless someone decides that they're going to talk back at me, we're going to enter now into a monologue. Hey, if you decide you want to talk back, I won't stop you. I may welcome it. Then again, I may not. <laughs> but a sermon is not just a speech, it is an interaction between one of the people of God and several of the people of God. One does the speaking, the several do the listening, and in the process is God's word. So, what happens with this sermon depends just as much on you as it does on me. Believe it. So, let's pray before we have a sermon. God, we come before you as your people, half blind, three fourths blind, mostly blind. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. Use the words that come out of my mouth and the words that these, your gathered people, hear to make your word present in our midst. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. All right. John 3.16. Y'all know it, right? Yeah. It starts out, For God so loved the world. Okay, I didn't learn Biblical Greek very well in seminary, but I think that phrase should read, For God so loves the world. And that means that God loves you. Each and every one of you. And God loves Grace United Methodist Church. And God loves the city of Missoula. And the county of Missoula. And the state of Montana. And the United States of America. And North America, including Canada and Mexico. And all of the so-called Western Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere, and the Northern Hemisphere, and the, in other words, the whole world, and the universe, and beyond that. God loves everything and everybody with an undying, passionate love. Now, one of the definitions of love that I've come across over the years is to wish or desire the best for someone. And of course, love is, in popular parlance, a nice, warm, cozy feeling of affection for someone else. But love is more than a wish or even an emotion. It is a way of behaving. Love requires action. God did not just sit in heaven and inspire psalmists and prophets to write about divine love. God came to live with us in the form of Jesus Christ. If that doesn't show God's love for us, what would? Now, as I read through the Bible, one of the things that keeps showing up over and over and over and 
over again is God's love. God loves the Hebrew people and delivers them from slavery in Egypt. God loves the people of Israel and Judah, delivers them from exile in Babylon. God sent prophets and priests to tell the people how to live. And then God came directly to us in Jesus of Nazareth to show us how to live and how to die. So what I'm suggesting in light of John 3.16 is that our eternal life begins when we decide we want to live like Jesus. That we want to follow where Jesus leads us. And brothers and sisters, that's not easy. Maybe you're a parent. That means that you raise kids. If you raise children without sinning, you're better not yet. Kids will try anyone's patience, especially teenagers. There were times when I sinned and did things to my kids for which I have been in deep repentance. They've forgiven me. God's forgiven me. I'm still working on forgiving myself. And one of the things I know for a fact is you were once a child. And if you were ever a child, you did not always act lovingly. Sometimes you didn't act lovingly toward your parents. Sometimes you didn't act lovingly toward your siblings, if you had any. Sometimes you didn't act lovingly toward your friends. Because it's hard. I mean, brothers and sisters and parents and children and friends get into disagreements and then they say things that they wish they hadn't and those things hurt. And sometimes you can get back to that good, solid relationship and sometimes you can't. I have known of relationships had them in my congregations where siblings got into major disagreements and no longer speak to each other. My father served a church. It was a Methodist church and diagonally across the intersection was an Evangelical United Brethren Church. I don't know how many of you were here when this was in UB. It's been a long time. But the Methodist Church was built first. And it was almost finished when the two brothers that were doing the building got into an argument about how to finish the building. So one of them simply went across the intersection and build a different church. It was while my father was there, and I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years later, that those two congregations finally got back together again. It's hard to live a life of love. It's very hard. I've said things to my wife that oh, she, she's still with me. That's her heart. Yes, that's her heart. <laughs> All of us have said and done things to people we love that we wish 
we had the things that were hurtful and harmful and okay we're we're united methodists we work on the teachings of john wesley and one of the things that wesley taught us was what's called entire sanctification or christian perfection but what that means is to become perfect in love and it's a path not a destination it's not some place we really arrive but rather a point in the distance that we are trying to get to <coughs> it's hard to live a life of love it's probably hard in this congregation to live a life of love and it's sometimes hard over at First United Methodist Church to live a life of love. And there have been people at First United Methodist Church who have gotten upset about something and left. And maybe that's happened here. I don't know. I'm not really a part of this congregation. But I know that churches can hurt people. And that part of what just happened at our general conference. Groups of people that wanted to be United Methodist but weren't really allowed to be United Methodist because they were called incompatible were hurt by the United Methodist Church. Some of them battled back, like our bishop. Others just left, like some of my seminary colleagues. Some of them are now pastors in other denominations because they couldn't be pastors in the United Methodist Church. Churches hurt people sometimes. People hurt people sometimes. And by gosh golly, political parties hurt people. A lot. And nations hurt people. And nations hurt other nations. And it's hard to live a life of love. But that's what Jesus came to show us how to do. Live a life of love. Today, in addition to being Memorial Day weekend, in the calendar of the church, universal, today is Trinity Sunday. You know, God Father, God Son, God Holy Spirit, all that stuff. In recent years, I've come up with my own personal definition of the Trinity. Try it on. You don't have to accept it, but try it on. God is love. I think that's in the Bible someplace, like maybe in the first letter of John. I know it's in the Bible someplace in the first letter of John. God is love. God came to earth in Jesus Christ. Jesus is, the, is God's love made manifest in human form. God is love. Jesus is God's love made manifest in human form. Oh, yeah, the Holy Spirit. The gift of God to help us live in love. So that's my current definition of the Trinity. God is love. Jesus is God's love manifest. And the Holy Spirit is with us to help us live in love. 
I really think the Beatles had something that they didn't really know the depth of. All you need is love. And one of the reasons all you need is love is because God is love. Do you need God? Jesus shows you how to live it, and the Holy Spirit helps you live it. Now, God doesn't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. God doesn't care less. You could be a Libertarian. You could be a Green Party. You could be Socialist. Whatever. God doesn't care what political party you belong to. But God does care whether or not you hate people of other political parties or love people of other political parties. If you're a Democrat, God wants you to love the Republicans, and if you're a Republican, God wants you to love the Democrats. God doesn't care if you're white or black or native or Asian or African or green or purple or whatever. But God does care whether or not you love people that look different from the way you look. And that would also include people who dress differently from you, speak different languages, or act differently. That can be really hard. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story. For several weeks, I was accosted by a man in the grocery store. He always had on a baseball cap that had some kind of Christian symbol on it. He approached me the first day with, do you have time to answer a couple questions? I said, okay. I'm trying to do grocery shopping, right? said, do you believe that there's a life beyond this one? I said, well, yeah. He said, do you believe in hell? I went, well, now that's a more difficult question. And he said, well, you know, Jesus talked about hell. And I said, uh, I have a master of theology. And, you know, Jesus didn't talk about hell that much. Oh, Jesus talks about hell all the time. I said, no, not really. So... It's evident you and I disagree on this topic, and I'm trying to do my grocery shopping, so later. But he wouldn't let go until I got kind of mean. The next week, same thing. The week after that, the same thing. I finally really got angry, and I used non-preacher language to tell him to leave me alone. I did not act lovingly toward him at that point. But he wasn't acting very lovingly toward me. That does not excuse my behavior. But this was a man who was trying to convert me to his brand of Christianity. That's not loving. Witness does not mean shoving your beliefs down somebody else's throat. It means sharing yours and listening to them. He really didn't want to hear what I had to say. And part of what I had to say is, this is a grocery store, not a place to have a theological discussion. I behaved inappropriately. That's one of my weaknesses when I'm feeling attacked. I can only last so long before I start back. And God knows that about me because I've certainly confessed it often enough. It's been two or three weeks, this guy, I don't even see him in the grocery store anymore. He was there every week for about a month. And maybe he changed his time of day to find another victim or something. I don't know. That, see, that's not very loving either, is it? It's hard to love people that are different from you. I was asked more than once, 
If God wants us to love everybody, why are there some people that are so unlovable? I would put this guy in that category, but that's my problem. My reply was always, because we need to practice loving. And it's obvious that being a pastor does not make me any more capable of loving than it makes you. I know lots of lay people that are a whole lot more loving, as near as I can tell, than I am. Doesn't matter what somebody else is like. Doesn't matter what they believe. They don't need to be Christian or Jewish. They might be Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu or atheist or agnostic. You know, agnostic really just means questioning, saying that you don't know. I don't know what they might be. They might actually be hostile to religion. Love them anyway. And loving them means treating them in a loving fashion. Oh, that's hard. Oh, that is so hard. Especially when you're caught off guard. Well, for me anyway. When I'm caught off guard is the times when I lash out. If I'm prepared for something, I can usually respond in a very loving fashion because I'm ready for it. But when I'm not ready for it, I don't do so well. See, God's still working on me. And I bet you God's still working on you. Love. <coughs> if I'd thought about it, I would have had the song before the scripture be, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Unfortunately, I see a lot of Christians that don't act very lovingly, so I'm not sure they're really Christians. Way back in the 60s, when I was a student here at the university, active in the Wesley Foundation, Bill Cliver said, the word Christian means Christ-like. What we are about, brothers and sisters, is following Jesus. I don't care what you believe. I want to see how well you follow Jesus. And you know what? Since I don't do a particularly good job, I'll be pretty forgiving of you. And hopefully you'll be forgiving of me. That's not always the case. I've met a lot of people in the church that are not very forgiving. Follow Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian, to follow Jesus. What would Jesus do? I wish we'd bring that back. It's less about what you believe and more about what you do. Both are important. But the older I get, and the more I grow in my faith, the more you know, I, I think living like Jesus is more important than what you believe about Jesus. John 3.16 doesn't say that God loves those who love Jesus, or that God loves those who love the church, or that God loves good people, or that God loves Montanans, or that God loves Americans, or white people, or those who are educated or cultured. John 3.16 says that God loves the world. That means everyone and everything. Americans and Chinese, Russians and Ukrainians, Israelis and Palestinians, South Koreans and North Koreans. But God also loves the mountains and the plains, the sheep and the wolves, 
the Grizzlies, and the Bobcats. <laughs> yeah, the sports teams as well as the animals. The iris and the redwood trees. God loves the world. All of it. And God wants us to love the world too. No exception. Okay, the hymn is number 530. Are ye able? We're skipping verse 3, verses 1, 2, and 4. Number 530. Or on the screen. <coughs> that I've started doing in the last, well actually quite a few years, is giving a commission along with the benediction. So here's the commission. This is your homework. And uh, I don't know if it actually gives you homework or not, but I'm giving you homework. Excuse me. This week, not just one week, that, right? You can do it. You got a whole week to do the homework. Well, this week, take a look at your life. Try to find ways in which 
you are very loving toward those that are a little harder to love. And as you do that, take a look at the ways in which you're not very loving toward those that are harder to love. And as you study on this, and look at this, and work on this, remember, God, the foundation of love, Jesus, love incarnate, and the Holy Spirit that lives among us and helps us love, is with you and remains with you always.